Hi, this is Abul Hussain coming to you live and direct from London, the United Kingdom. And I have a very special guest with me today who is going to talk to you about storytelling and using stories to sell. Now, before I introduce her, if you are watching this video outside of our Facebook group for social media marketing agencies, uh, do find the link and join us there, especially if you're looking to start or grow an existing agency. So without a further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Megan Fisk. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to speak with you and the audience that you've built. Thank you very much for joining us because I know you're joining us from Atlanta, Georgia, and you have quite an interesting history because you have a PhD from uh, Arizona State University. You've been a college professor for over 10 years, and now you are working with leaders and entrepreneurs in, I suppose, finding their voice. So in your own words, uh, do feel free to introduce yourself to us and what you actually do. Yeah, sure. I mean, the short answer is I make public speaking feel good and easy. So whether you're an entrepreneur or a leader, I work with quite a few politicians too. Like public speaking shouldn't be something that we're so afraid of. Like it's just having a conversation. And I know now that we've moved virtually for so many things, there's all this other pe like public speaking anxiety that's come up for folks. And like, you know, right now I'm speaking into the abyss of my room. And so it gets awkward. Um, but in terms of my background, yeah, I was a college professor at Arizona State University. And that's where I did my PhD on an organizational communication. I spent the first half really studying how societies fall apart <laughs> and doing some counterterrorism research and then really switched gears and was like, well, how do we prevent that from happening? How do we build societies up in communication, finding communion with one another? That's like the root of the word communication is really how we do that. Um, and so I am so privileged to have the job that I have and I love learning new things. So I get to learn something new from every person I talk to. I'm always like, oh, I still get paid for learning. That's what being an academic is. So it's really great. Um, being an entrepreneur definitely comes with a whole different set of challenges than being an academic does, but I'm loving it. So. Yeah, that's that's great. Um, and obviously you've, you've got a program where you're talking about using stories to, to sell, uh, which, which is launching uh, very soon because of the free Facebook challenge. So talk about storytelling and why is it so important in communicating and getting our message across to our audience? Yeah, I mean, stories are fundamentally human, right? There's a scholar named Kenneth Burke that talks about us as homo nerens, like storytelling animals. It's how, our societies are constructed. We reinforce our culture through storytelling, but I'll be less academic. Stories are what sells you, right? Like when you're looking at thousands of people that do similar things to you, your competitive advantage is really you, right? And we all have these stories and you know what makes us likable, what builds our trust, what gets people to know us. That, no like trust factor that everyone talks about that is rooted really in storytelling and being open to share like who we are so um in terms of why stories are so important i like i've been come like obsessed with puzzles um since i've been home so much like everyone else do you like puzzles oh yeah absolutely <laughs> yeah and so i look at stories like individual puzzle pieces for putting together our speeches so we're a lot of my clients is identifying the eight to ten stories that tell not only like your story as an entrepreneur but also your clients like where are they starting what journey are they going on and that you're helping them um, like what's that transformation journey what are some of these other supporting examples that we can put as stories and once you construct those pieces that's when the real fun starts because you can do interviews like this and always have something to talk about mm -hmm. so, story piece and you get to arrange them in different orders and that sort of thing. So I love looking at it like a puzzle, like, and of course, a speech is always going to have an introduction, body and conclusion. So it's just one big puzzle. And once you construct the pieces, it becomes so much easier, right? I'm all about making it easy. So it's not like every day you have to reinvent the wheel. And from like a marketing perspective, being consistent is so important. 
right? Like if I got on tomorrow and started talking all about something else, like I talk a lot about more of like the energetic side of speaking too, um, because so many people have like this fear of public speaking and it's just energy, right? But if I got on tomorrow and was like, actually, yeah, you need to beat down your fear, <laughs> like overcome it, conquer it, right? That would be so off message for me. Um, so you want to be consistent and telling the same stories is really how you maintain that consistency. Mm -hmm. I speak to a lot of entrepreneurs who have been practitioners, experts in their fields for a very long time. And they're like, I don't have this story, you know? So from your perspective, when you are working with an entrepreneur who feels like, who has the expertise, but feels like they don't have a story, how do you craft that story? What do you feel are the core components of a good story? Yeah, so let's start with just the founder story. So that's what we'll really be working on next week in my free five day stories that sells challenge because everyone has a founding story as an entrepreneur. Maybe it's not the most exciting, but there's some reason that you got into this and you decided that yes, this is the path that I'm going to take. And you can start to really probe and find out like, okay, like, so I have a whole series of journaling questions, of course, like, that's where we start is like really becoming aware of like, oh, what is my mission statement, right? Most entrepreneurs have those. Why did we develop it that way? Um, and then it's really fun to begin in the middle of the story instead of like at the beginning, right? So instead of, well, one day we'll use Mark Zuckerberg. I was sitting in my college room thinking blah, 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 right? It's much more fun to think about, okay, when was it that was really hard and you almost quit building your company, right? And you start there and then you kind of do that rewind with your story and then you give that trajectory that success story mm -hmm. and one thing you have pointed out is that people fear uh kind of public speaking getting in front of of a camera and i think we've probably seen such research done that people would prefer to be in a casket in their graves than to go in front of an audience and and speak so how can someone who has this fear of public speaking or even getting on camera take some steps to overcome this fear yeah, I love this question so much um, because the first thing is fundamentally shifting your paradigm on speaking <laughs> and, and how you're looking at that nervous energy. So first, even labeling it, like a lot of people, um, we've got, you know, the same butterflies in your stomach, right? And your butterflies are flapping and you're like so scared. Other people, it's like their throat's closing in on them or they turn bright red. Our bodies do have this physical response. And the thing is, is like, especially the butterflies in the, feel, in the stomach feeling, that's extra energy your body's using and like producing to help you speak better when it comes to being red faced and like your throat shrinking in, those are some other issues that we can talk about. But like the most common one is this butterflies in your stomach feeling and we're labeling that as negative. And so instead I talk a lot about how we can make friends with that fear and be like, oh, it's okay. Like, remember we're spoken before, no one laughed at us. We still made a sale. It wasn't the end of the world. Right, so drawing on our past experience to talk our fear down some, and then using it to connect with our audience, to be like, oh, I'm still passionate and excited about this. Um, I talk a lot about like flow state, like the best speakers are really speaking from flow state, where time stands still and you're drawing in every one of their words, and time standing still for them is the speaker. I don't know if you've ever experienced it, but sometimes when you're speaking, it's like time literally is dead still. Do you have that experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> right. And it's a practice. Um, so for me, for flow state, the first time I experienced it, I did dance all through growing up and was on like our high school dance team, very American. <laughs> and I would lose myself dancing, right? Like it was just something where I was so absorbed in it. Um, and I would also get super nervous before like a halftime performance. But then eventually I lost that like nervousness feeling and like in retrospect, I know that was losing passion for dancing, right? Like my life had gone in other directions. It just wasn't part of my identity anymore. And so I think by reframing the nervousness, we're able to look at it as like, no, this is actually just passion. This is like extra creativity. Elizabeth Gilbert says fear and creativity are conjoined twins. You can't have one without the other. And I so agree. And so if we're looking then at our nervous energy, it's just 
creative energy that we can use to connect more with our audience, that paradigm shift is going to pay you dividends, right? Like the more that you can tell yourself that, that like, no, I'm just here to have a good time and to be creative and to really share with the audience what they need to know, the more mm -hmm. fun public speaking is going to be. Yeah, I know some speakers before they go on stage or before they go on camera, they get in state, right? They'll have some sort of a ritual. Uh, do, you, do you have a ritual or have you worked on rituals with others? Yeah, I do. I talk about pre-speaking rituals all the time. Uh, so much of it is mindset and it's like building in that belief. Um, so I'm a big meditation practitioner and visualization of like visualizing what your performance is actually going to be like. So let's say you're giving a TED talk. If you can actually go into that space and see what it's like a couple weeks before and make that mental image and then every day practice, like do that visualization where you're sitting here, your eyes are closed, you're imagining yourself on stage, then when it gets to be that actual day of the speech, you're able to have already built that muscle memory in your brain. Um, so my pre-speaking ritual happens far before the actual moment. And then of course doing just some vocal warm-ups before you go out. Um, and then I usually play, there's one song that I really like before I do like a Facebook Live. I played it before this interview. Um, it's like a really yoga hippie song, <laughs> but it like centers me and it's like what I practice with with meditation too. Um, so there's something to like that repetition and making sure that your brain is like really you're changing the neural network in your brain to make public speaking easy. Yeah. And you touched upon uh, reframing uh, your thoughts, which is an NLP technique. And NLP is huge in a lot of the communication circles, if you like, personal development circles. And another thing, uh, another technique, I suppose, that you find uh, within NLP is metaphors. So um, do you use metaphors in your program or in pro producing your stories? How does this fit in? Yeah, you know, so metaphors are such a fun rhetorical device. When it comes to like the NLP world, I had never heard of them, like did all of my PhD, <laughs> like had no idea that was a thing until I started my speech coaching business. And I'd see like the hashtag around and I was like, huh, these guys might be onto something. It's kind of like, um, like, I think it's really creative and cool, but I don't know much about NLP and, you know business model too but in terms of metaphor yeah like that's a rhetorical technique that's been being used for centuries and there's a whole field of rhetoric that's been studying the metaphors we use and how that shapes our world like we know from the staff warfare hypothesis that like the way the language we use and the languages we speak shapes our brain like if you look at my brain versus someone in china's brain like we're using different parts based on the language that and this like words and their meaning like that we have so um metaphors become so cool and so important and i'm hyper conscious and get my clients to that point too to make sure that like you know, i work a lot with wellness entrepreneurs we're never going to use like a shot metaphor <laughs> like we don't shoot things i'm not going to shoot you an email like that's not a phrase that would come out of our mouth so uh -huh. Right. And I think um, it's a good tip for marketers too, is like what metaphors are the, your ideal clients wanting to mm. use? And are they going to be receptive to? Yeah, uh, ab absolutely. So, you know, a story is a story and, you know, we've heard stories. Some of them are good, some of them are great, and some of them are quite poor. And we often experience it if you're at a conference and you have a speaker who is quite flat. And they might have an amazing story, but because of the way they deliver it, it comes across as to be quite poor. Whereas someone comes with a bit more energy and they get rapturous applause. So, you know, in your experience, what do you find to be the difference between a good story and a bad story? Or is it all in the delivery? Well, this is a great question because delivery is so much of it, right? Like one of the exercises I'm going to have everyone do in the challenge is to practice like energy and vocal inflection is reading a children's story. Like think of Cat in the Hat. I could read it one way, you'd read it totally different and the audience would have a totally different perception. But this is what I was going to say about your question is so much of, I think the biggest difference is that audience. 
right? If uh, your story is self-centered and like I centered, your audience isn't going to respond to it. Every speech that you give, every story you tell has to be for your audience and from their perspective. So the stories that really capture us are the ones that let us be part of the journey, that suck us in and are like, yeah, like this is a journey I wanna go on with this person, like, or you feel like you're there. And so being really descriptive in your language um, is one of the other cool ways that you can have that connection. But you're right, like so much of it is the energy. But I think that big difference is when you're looking at the speakers that I tend to see that fall flat are coming at it from like, okay, here's the most important information I can give you instead of here's the most important information the audience needs at this moment in time to take the next step. Mm -hmm. And I think when someone is uh, talking about their uh, origin story or their founding story, it's quite easy to kind of rehearse something. However, when an entrepreneur is going live to their audience for five or 10 minutes a day, or, you know, kind of just do shooting, shooting a YouTube video, how do they kind of deliver it and get the same response when they are not necessarily speaking about their actual story? I mean, how would you structure a shorter presentation that isn't necessarily about where they've come from oh i see your question yeah so when it comes to like doing live videos i'm such a huge advocate of it um and i did a free challenge a couple months back on just this thing i do a free challenge every month in my solopreneur speaking community because everyone needs like a practice space like that's number one public speaking tip is you have to actually practice but um more towards your question is like how you structure it. That's why I really love this puzzle piece metaphor that I was using is you just need to craft out the pieces. And so um, I come from like the coaching background now and I work a lot with like life coaches, yoga teachers, these types of folks. And so most of them have a coaching framework. Um, if you're, I think your audience is more small businesses. You have mm -hmm. like content pillars um, and like the products that you have, that sort of thing. So you like a little pitch script for each one of them, I would think. Um, so it's building out those puzzle pieces and then having that freedom to rift on them, right? So every day I go, or not every day, every week, <laughs> I also go live in my solopreneur speaking community, just do a short speech. Um, and it's because I just know my content so well. But in terms of how you actually structure it, Facebook Live and YouTube are kind of different things. Mm -hmm. For a Facebook Live, you really need those points of engagement because that's going to get it viewed more by your audience. So I like to have at least one in the introduction, two that I kind of plan in the body. Of course, if something like inspires me in the moment, I'm going to. And then one final conclusion, like point of engagement. So that's as simple as, hey, if you're watching this, tell me where you're watching from. Um, at the end, of course, like if you have questions, feel free to reach out, drop, you know, an emoji down here. Um, what I've really, I've seen some people doing lately that I really like is like, hey, if you relate to this, drop a one. Or if you relate to this other thing, drop a two. And then they tailor it towards uh, the feedback that they're getting in the moment. And that's really easy to see from the speaker perspective. That's another challenge of Facebook that a lot of people have is what to do when people are joining and leaving. It really throws people off, which understandably, right? You start with 10 people watching your live and you can see that 10 people are watching and then you look back down and no one's watching and you're like, ah, is this something I said? And no, like <laughs> that's totally like you imposing all of these thoughts and opinions and beliefs on the people that were watching. We've all done it. You click into a video and then you're actually at work, not supposed to be watching it or whatever. But um, then when it comes to like structuring on YouTube and I mean, the basic format that works really well for any speech, any speaking occasion is going to be the three by three format. You have three subtopics and each subtopic gets three points. Um, Another one that I really like is challenge action result. It's CAR. So first you talk about the challenge your audience is probably having some actions they can take now and then the expected result. And I come from like the relationship building, like relational marketing, right? Like I want to build this relationship. I want to get people results before they ever get on a strategy or sales call with me. So they know that I'm the right person for them. Um, so I'm all about like solving that first challenge people have, which is usually public speaking fear before mm -hmm. 
happen to, okay, now you're going to apply to do a TED talk or now you want to host your own challenge, like what your speaking project is type of thing. So right. roundabout answer, but hopefully that has some tips. No, that's, that's, that's a great answer. And, and you did end up on, on a couple, giving a couple of examples with a uh, challenge action result. Uh, which someone can take away and actually apply and uh, can see how that framework would work. Now, when it comes to storytelling or writing some sort of a story, you know, some, some members of the audience who are watching this would be familiar with the story brand framework or with the hero's journey, etc. Do you use your own framework to craft a story or do you take a bespoke approach with every client? Yeah, I mean, here's the hero's journey, the story brand, like information is all readily available online, right? The magic that comes is in the practicing. Um, so I just do a really easy three part, like you have a beginning, middle and end. You want to have that rising action to the middle. It's like the climax of it. You want to identify the characters in the story. Um, I see that go wrong for a lot of people as they bring in way too many characters <laughs> or like they go too far on the descriptive side and you can, get so granular with storytelling or keep it big picture. So I do tailor it towards like where the client's at, but I think the fun of it is to go with what's natural for you and not to overthink it, right? Because I know there's like, uh, like you can totally overthink it or go with someone that is like a storytelling coach that's going to go in and be like, okay, here's each piece that you need. And I, there is value in that for sure, but I'm more macro level, like let's get these eight to 10 stories figured mm -hmm. out what these puzzle pieces are going to be. And then you naturally refine them the more that you're speaking about them and you see what's landing with the audience and what's not. Right, great. Uh, before we go on to your actual um, Facebook challenge, I have one kind of action focused question, if you like. If I am nervous about public speaking, what are maybe four or five things that I can actually do to see the quickest result in my confidence, in my delivery, in also, I suppose, my audience's appreciation? Awesome. Yeah. So we were talking about pre-speaking rituals. The more that you build that up and like make it a part of your life, the easier it's going to be. Um, I'm a big proponent of power posing. I think we've probably all seen Amy Cuddy's <laughs> video, right? <laughs> Standing like superwoman. Um, I really like mountain pose. That's a yoga pose where your arms, your hands are out and you're like standing still and just feeling like you're on top of the mountain free. Um, another one that I think is often is actually having a post speaking ritual. So what I mean by this is once we get off of here, I'm going to put on, I've been a big Lizzo fan lately. So probably one of her songs and like dance around and be like, that was the most exciting thing I've ever done and was so much fun. And I absolutely loved it because it goes back into reprogramming our brains so much. So many of my clients are like, well, I get off my live and then I sit there and I think about how terrible it was or I watch it back right away and start nitpicking away at things and really the power of celebration. Like making it be like, yeah, no, this was awesome. Like, I love this feeling. It was so great. Um, we'll go towards building that skill. And like, that would be the fourth one is you just really have to practice. Mm -hmm. um, so I know Toastmasters has moved online now. Um, it, Toastmasters is just very dependent on the location, um, which I think is cool now that it's online. Mm -hmm. um, I also host like a Soul Speakers Academy where you can practice the five speeches every entrepreneur needs to succeed. Um, but enrollment won't be until like the last quarter of the year at this point. Okay. Um, but looking for these opportunities to practice speaking when someone invites you like this to come and chit chat with them, take them up on it and just roll with the punches right um and yeah. then it's still a challenge and it's still like this big mindset block um, and you're i've got one client that had been thinking about doing online videos for three years before she did my free challenge back in like february and it was like we were talking about reframing overcoming fear into like making friends with it was a big shift for her and just knowing that you can't do it wrong. <laughs> like there is, the only way you fail is by not trying, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. 
Perfect. So you've got this free challenge launching on Facebook next week called Stories That Sell. Uh, final question to you. Do you want to just run through the program, how many days it's going to go on for, what the actual content is going to be, and what I suppose your participants can hope to get out of it? Yeah, that'd be so great. Thanks for the opportunity. So it's a five day um, free challenge. I think it's at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So a little earlier than this one. And it's a 20 to 30 minute training every day where then I give you an action step to take where you come on live in the group and share part of your speech. So like the first day, of course, we'll start with introductions. Um, and like I said earlier, this time around, I'm really framing it around the founder story. So even if you don't have any clients yet, or you're not quite sure what your customer journey is going to be, you have something to talk about in the challenge. And then I use my coaching framework each of the days after that. So my framework is soul, um, which is really friending public speaking fear. We'll talk through, do some more exercises like we've talked about today. Then I talk about strategy. Like when, what are you going to use speeches for to accomplish your goal? Like the when, the what, and the how. Um, then we talk about structure. So in terms of like that car framework that I gave or the three by three. So we'll structure your founding story. Um, and then the last day is all about style. How do we present our speech? How do we showcase our personality and like the words that we use, the body language, all of that I put under my style framework. Um, and so my four S's of speeches are really the ones that I use for all of my work is my framework and it works so well. Um, I also love the community that gets built around each one of my challenges because everyone's so supportive and it's a lot of people that have either gone live once or twice and didn't really see any results or they've always wanted to, but they've never had like the encouragement to do it or that sort of thing. So it's very supportive um, and I'd love to have as many people that feel like they want to do it come on in. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, I, I am looking forward to it. And if you are watching uh, Dr. Megan here and you want to join in, in the challenge, I will be tagging her to the video. So go onto her profile and you'll find the link. So just to wrap it up, you've been very generous with your time. Dr. Megan Fisk, thank you very much for joining us.